picture, if you will, a desolate forest shrouded in mystery, where the legendary creature known as Bigfoot mysteriously vanishes through a portal, defying all known laws of reality. Journey further into the depths of Native American mythology, where stone giants rise from the earth, ancient adversaries of immense power. But hold your breath, it does not end there. Imagine a humble kitchen where a haunted microwave carries a ghostly message from beyond the veil. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I hope you have had a wonderful week. I am breathing a little easier, quite Literally, it seems the pollution from the Canadian wildfires for now has died down. It was a rough couple of weeks. Today's still kind of bad. The humidity's in the air, but the rain we've had here in Johnstown has really, really helped. It's hurt as well. I spent an extra hundred bucks this week on some dehumidifiers, so hopefully that will help. And uh, really looking forward to, uh, quite honestly, looking forward to November. Whenever I can finally get some health insurance. My wife and I, the lovely Ariana, have made some financial moves for the positive, And it looks like we're finally going to be able to afford health insurance. So I'm looking forward to November whenever that finally kicks in. I can get my lungs looked at, a few other problems I'm, I'm having. And... Uh, and hopefully live a long and happy life. Now, on to the tales. Our first tale is going to take us to Roan Mountain in eastern Tennessee, sometime in the mid-80s to early 90s. The witness who has decided to remain anonymous, was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1964. Now, up until his mid-twenties, he'd never been on higher ground. Nothing more than a couple hundred feet above sea level. But, at the time of the story, his sister had gotten married and moved to the Rhone Mountains. And he decides he's going to take a trip, visit her for a week. And the first few days, it's the standard visiting, running around, seeing the sights, and we're just really hanging out at the house. A couple of beers are consumed, the grill is fired up, and the time ends up getting kind of late. It's around 9 p.m., and the witness goes out on the back porch to get another beer. And he looks off in the distance, about a hundred yards in the field behind the house. There's about a dozen deer. Now, obviously, this man's some sort of hunter. He notices one has a really, really nice set of antlers. But far enough away that he can't make out the number of points. He very slowly maneuvers off the porch, eases over to the corner of the fence. Now, this is shaved off about 30 or 40 yards. So, now, just to, where it was like a football field away, now we're talking just a little over half a football field. And he sees it. This, this deer. Ten point minimum. Beautiful deer. He looks up. He sees the moon. And the moon is just huge. And it seems... It seems so much closer than he's ever seen it before. The witness has been out in the Gulf of Mexico at times. And he's been able to see the moon away from city lights. And you can see all sorts of detail with the naked eye. But this, this is something different. He's awestruck. 
Now he's watching the deer. He thinks that he's been watching this for about 20 minutes. Later on, though, he's dealing with missing time. He finds out it was more like an hour. The witness noticed a tickling sensation on the back of his neck. He kind of like shrugs his shoulders real quick and just kind of shaking loose what that, that tingling is. The deer gets spooked. The quick movements, they, they flee. He realizes he's probably been out there long enough. And he decides to go back. And he feels hot breath on the back of his neck. And he hears this rumbling. He looks to his right over his shoulder. The witness then realizes in a split second that his face is maybe eight, maybe ten inches away from the upper abdomen of a Bigfoot. He looks up and he sees the pectoral muscles stick off the chest about six inches. The chest is four and a half feet wide, shoulders as big as basketballs, adding another foot on either side. This thing is at least, at least six feet wide. Didn't get a good look at his hands. Didn't get a good look at the face. But he did see the arms. Hilariously, the witness thinks, okay, the wrestler Hulk Hogan has 22-inch arms. Then, if that's true, then whatever this creature is, the arms have to be about 28 30 inches. And these arms, they're covered in long, dark hair, four to six inches in length. He's, he's guessing that this creature is around 10 feet tall, putting it in the seven to 800 pound range. Remember, he is so close so close and at the angle at the angle he's at the only thing the witness can see is a squared off bearded chin no nose no eyes no ears nothing and that's not saying it's not there it's just he can't see it he can't decide whether this thing is a man or ape The arms are definitely ape-like. The chest is human-like. He spins around. He's, He's looking up. This thing is, this beast, this creature, this entity, is going from a bent over position to standing up straight and taking a step back. As this Bigfoot pulls his left leg over his right, it's as if he's slipping through a slit in a green screen in reality. The witness is not sure if it was a portal, a doorway of some sort, a cloaking mechanism. All the witness knows is this thing vanished in a split second. There was no skunk-like foul smell of death, like with normal Bigfoot. There was just this slightly musty smell. Same smell that a horse gives off. The witness goes on to, to ponder a lot of people saying that Bigfoot is evil, that they're demons. And he admits they may be, but the impression that he got from this entity was that 
it was intelligent and that he that he appreciated his interest in the moon the mmm that the creature gave out it made the witness feel the same way he would feel when he would do something good that would make his grandfather proud it was an approving gesture it was an intelligent gesture it was a very human gesture But not all of the forest giants are intelligent and approving and gentle. The Cherokee speak of the none you knew we. The Iroquois have a similar creature they call the Janosqua. Now, the stories of these creatures or creature vary. In some versions, there's only one. In some versions of the story, there are a whole race of them. And us, the Europeans, the colonizers of this world, some would say the ruiners of this world, we name them the Stoneclads. Now, in some versions of the tale, the Stoneclads the Janosqua, they're human, but they have the power, much like a skinwalker, to turn themselves into an invisible monster. In, in other tales, these are Sasquatch who have gone feral and roll themselves in the mud so that the mud dries in their fur, giving them a stone-like armor. Whatever these creatures are, even though this is mythology, I believe in some respect they must have existed. I don't remember who told it to me, but I have been told that a myth is the truth wrapped in a lie. A lot of the missing 411 cases are unusual. I do believe that David Polites over exaggerates from, well, more than from time to time. I would say more often than not. But there are some cases that are very interesting. Is it these stone clads, these genosquas? Is that what is at least partially responsible for these missing people. There are a lot of cases where it was like Mr. Dog and Mr. Bear, the children who vanish and come back. Mr. Dog wouldn't let me eat these berries. Mr. Dog wouldn't let me call out to the people looking for me. Mr. Bear kept me warm at night. Are these legends true? I'd like, to, I'd like to tell you the legend of a, of a man who had defeated one of the, one of the Janosqua. This is a Seneca legend. And the legend goes as such. Once there was a village in a clearing of the forest... Now, the people of these village, they knew, do not go north. For in the north, the Janosqua lived. And they were man-eaters. As is the case, one man steps forward and says, I'm not afraid of these Janosqua. I bet there's good hunting up there. And I'm going. And if they trouble me, I will kill them. 
the man and his wife make preparations, and they get into the canoe and row up the river until they come to the country of the Janosqua. The man and his wife pull the canoe to the bank. She makes a fire while he goes hunting. And while he's gone, a Janosqua woman comes into the camp. The wife sees this beast, and she becomes so frightened that she faints. The Janosqua woman pushes the limp body around and says she must have been a long time dead. After a few moments, the woman comes too. She runs to the river, pulls the canoe into the water, goes into the river and rows away. The stone coat follows her to the bank of the river, but couldn't go any farther. No canoe. The wife finds the husband and says, You said you could kill these. Prove it. There's one up there. Prove it. Now this, this man had brought a flint knife. And he begins to sharpen it. He's sitting by his fire. And a Janosquin man comes to the opposite side of the river and calls out to him. You're the man who boasts you can kill the stone clads. Come over and try your strength. And he looks at the Janosqua, the stone clad, and says, No, no, I'm not coming over to you. You come to me. A few minutes of trash talk go back and forth. And finally, the Janosqua, frustrated, starts to cross the river. The water gets so deep in the river that it covers the Janosqua's head. These are creatures of stone. He's not going to be able to swim. He walks under the water. The man runs up the river to where he had seen a tree in the water, and he crosses over the tree, runs back down the bank, and when the Janosqua comes out of the water, the man shouts to him, Where are you going? You got turned around under the river. Stonecoat, he's confused. And he starts back. And while he's under the water, the man crosses the tree again. The Janosqua comes out of the river. Once again, what he perceives to be the wrong side of the river. And the man shouts out, you're a fool. Are you so stupid that you can't cross a river? This goes back and forth. Almost robotic-like behavior from the Janosqua. The man is over here. I go to him. This is not a twice thing. This is not a three times thing. This happens a number of times. The man goes, okay, this time, I'm going to fight him. I'll let him come. I won't fool him again. The Janosqua comes out of the river. He looks at the man and goes, what's that in your hand? He goes, this is my hatchet. And he gives the hatchet over to the Janosqua. This being of stone rubs the edge of the hatchet with his hand. Sharpens it. Makes it, makes it so powerful that it was harder than anything else in the world. The Janosk was amused. Tosses it back to the man. Says, show me what you can do with this. The man takes a hatchet, strikes a rock, and the rock splits open, frightening the Janosqua. 
This man, he thinks, this man is as strong as a Janosqua. Maybe he can kill us. And he leaves. He crosses the river and walks off. He reaches home and told his tribe, this man has the power to kill us. We'll go away from here. We'll go towards the west. We'll leave him. Now this man and his wife lived undisturbed in that land until one day a Janosquan woman came to the bark house that they had built. The man sits down with her and the Janosquan woman says, my husband and I got into an argument and I ran away. He's, he's going to come looking for me. And after he has looked everywhere else, he's going to come here. And the two of them make a deal. The Janosquan woman will help them at their house. She will do chores, cut firewood, help them hunt. She will help them. But whenever her husband comes to find her, they must help her. The Janosquan woman is true to her word. She brought him amazing luck. Every day she goes hunting, they kill an amazing amount of game. One morning, the Janosquan woman comes to the, the human couple and says, my husband is going to come today. This is how you kill us. When we begin to fight, you got to put a stick in the fire. And heat it until it is red hot. He's going to overpower me. He will throw me. He will try to kill me. Whenever he does this, run the hot stick into his body. True to her word, the Janosquan husband came and he pulls up a tree by the roots. His wife... The Janosquan woman pulls up another tree and they begin to fight using the trees as clubs. The woman fell. And that's the moment that our hero runs the firebrand into the stone coat's body, killing him. The, the wife and the husband look at each other. The human wife and husband. And go, we, we, can't, we can't stay here. They're going, they're going to go back to their village. The, the Janosquan woman looks at them and goes, whenever you chased off the, uh, the rest of us, one of our women left her little boy. You, I can't raise him. You need to take him home with you. And so they do. They find this child, take him home, and this Janosquan boy, as he grew up, was incredibly strong. If he so much as played with one of the children, the strength of this boy would kill that child. The people of the village, they gathered together and said, we have to send him back. They send for the stone-clad woman. She comes, sees what's happened, and agrees, and takes the boy back to his mother. It's not quite what you would think, is it? You would think a story about a Native American man fighting a cannibalistic creature like the Janosqua. 
it would be him going up some sort of, uh, up against some sort of mindless beast. But that's not what we have here. We we seem to have an entity that has a culture that has a family unit and the ability to communicate. There is a fantastic documentary from 2008. It's not very long, an hour and three minutes. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you, that you watch this documentary. It's called Not Your Typical Bigfoot Movie. It's, it follows two amateur Bigfoot researchers in Ohio. And not only does it show you how, how odd and honestly bloodthirsty the Bigfoot research community is, but it shows you two friends that have a fair amount of success hunting Bigfoot. One photo in particular, quite amazing. But what fascinates me, what it connects with this story of the Janosqua, whenever, whenever they go out, they will talk to the Bigfoots. They will try to attract them using Native American language. If they were just beast, it wouldn't work. But if they have a language, as not your typical Bigfoot movie would suggest, as the Sierra Sounds tapes would suggest, if they have a language, then we have to look at them as more than just forest creatures. Are we dealing with another society? We talk about breakaway civilizations all the time. We always think of it as super high-tech breakaway civilizations. Center of the earth type deals. But maybe it's, it's in the other direction. Maybe there are breakaway civilizations that we have not detected on this earth because technologically they are so far behind us. Our last tale is going to take us back to the year somewhere 2009, 2010. I don't have the witness's name. This is from a very, very old Reddit post. Huge thank you going out to John for pointing me in the direction of this. This what I assume is a woman. This woman has had her son young. She's a single parent. She's 20. But whenever she was 23, fresh out of university, she's, she ends up buying a house thanks to Obama's first time home buyer's credit. It's just a tiny little place, but she loves it. It was, it was formerly owned by a woman named Barbara, who, who had died prematurely from genetic heart disease. The witness never knew Barbara, but she knew about her. She knew that she was an incredible gardener, and she really struggled to keep the plants alive. She knows Barbara was an incredible seamstress who made her own curtains, and she took those curtains with her when she moved. Barbara was unmarried the connection was nothing paranormal it was just it was just this was a person who called this place home and i call this place my home 
And it's the same place. Flash forward a few months. They're taking out the trash Labor Day weekend. And they see a skinny, nearly hairless dog on the street. And it comes right over to them. The woman and her son take the dog in. Nurse him back to health. And give him the wonderful name Crypto. That's Superman's dog. Crypto. Later... A neighbor would tell the woman that she'd seen Crypto curled up sleeping next to the house and prayed that Crypto would find a good home soon. The witness doesn't really believe in the power of prayer, but something in her soul tells her that this is relevant. Crypto had some odd health problems. Initial dermatitis a tumor on the foot, an unknown illness. Now this illness manifested itself as strange, unexplained periods of lethargy, a lack of appetite during the spring and summer, blood work, ultrasounds. None of it came back with anything definite. Months, he would get better, then he would get sick again. Back and forth. Four years with not one confirmed diagnosis. A lot of diseases rolled out, but nothing confirmed. The vets have a theory that it was some sort of tick-borne illness that affected his liver. Flash forward to 2016. her current partner, Brandon, and Brandon's son move into the house with them. They live together, and about a year passes. One day, the witness is in the kitchen making the school lunches for the kids, and the microwave vent fan comes on. She goes to turn it off. And notice there's a notification on the microwave. There was an indication of a new message on the display. And there was a button on the bottom of the microwave that was lit up right there next to the vent fan button was a message button. She had never noticed the message button before. I've never known of a message button on a microwave. But she presses it. What she gets back is mostly static. But you can tell someone is speaking. She plays the message a few times, trying to make it out. There's something there. They're they're speaking with this southern drawl. But they can't make it out. At this time, though, crypto is very very sick and getting sicker by the day so she just puts the message on hold brandon her her partner is working long hours she mentions the message to him he's as confused but despite the long hours brandon becomes obsessed trying to figure out what the message says he plays it over and over tens of times a day And every time, it's just that same static with that that talking in the background, that male southern drawl. November 2017, crypto is so bad that the family has to make the very, very difficult decision to let him go. I've always thought that it's a blessing that, that animals have that that they don't have to suffer. We as humans, we have to suffer. But animals are spared that indignity. It hurts us. We're the ones that have to go through it. And I certainly hope they're waiting for us on the other side. I believe they are. She wants comfort from Brandon. This is a rough time. God, I'm tearing up right now. Thinking of... Thinking of, well, we recently had a health 
health scare with Alex, our one cat. We've got four other cats. I love them dearly. Pebbles. Oh, if something would happen, my Chihuahua Pebbles. I'm just tearing up. But, and I would be hurt. I would be hurt too. If, if Ariana was more worried about the microwave than me, uh, I would be hurt too. She wouldn't be. I think Ariana cares for me more than I care for myself. But the witness goes up, goes into the kitchen, and just she's getting ready to to kind of kind of yell at Brandon. Go, come on, let it loose! And he whips his head at her and goes, "I know what it says." She goes, "Tell me." But he doesn't. He wants her to play the message one more time. It's still sat- static. But the voice begins to play. And it's clearer. And for the first time, the first time, the witness hears in that slow southern draw, that deep male voice, she hears, that feller right there is going to die soon. She's stunned. Who was in her house? That wasn't logical. Nothing's taken. Nothing's disrupted. Why would you record the message on the microwave? Why, why does the microwave even have a message button? And by the way, I looked into it. There are microwaves with message buttons. I'm probably as stunned as you are. Why is it so clear now after the hundreds of times it's been played? Looking back, the witnesses, they wish they wouldn't have done this. They wanted to delete the message. The microwave quit working a few months later. They sold the house and they moved to Colorado shortly thereafter. The witness thinks of themselves as an analytical and logical person, non-religious, loves math, third generation engineer. But they cannot find the logic in this experience. Was there an actual person in the house that recorded this message on the microwave by accident on purpose? Well, if so, why is it clearly audible after weeks of static? Was the house bugged, including the microwave, and the message was recorded on there remotely? Okay, but why would somebody bug the house? Or was this, was this somebody, was this somebody who knew that dog was going to die and they had died themselves? And the same way this woman and her family did not want crypto to be alone in life, this person did not want crypto to be alone in death. Thank you for joining us again this week on Strange Pathways. If you are having mental health trouble dealing with a paranormal incident, please reach out to the PRUS Network. Their website is www.opusnetwork.org. That, one more time, opusnetwork.org. Head over to our Twitter, Pathways Strange, TikTok, and Instagram, Strange Pathways Podcast. Come on over to our Facebook group. We're going to have a few photos. I know it's been a while since I put photos up, but we're going to have a few photos dealing with the tales that we had here today. And if you'd like to email me, you can do so at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. We hit 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. Wow. Granted, I'm not PewDiePie. I'm, 
I'm not Boogie2988, but you know what? 5,000, I will take them and cherish them all. Thank you so, so much. And you know what? I'm going to be a little greedy. Let's go for 10,000. Thank you once again for joining us here on Strange Pathways. Take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>